This is Dr. Albert Schweitzer. These are the people to whom he has devoted his life in Gabon, a province in French Equatorial Africa. Dr. Schweitzer runs a hospital for the people of Gabon. For the 40 years since he founded this hospital, he has been not only their doctor, caring for the sick and the injured, but their teacher, their builder, designing, planning, and working side by side with them to create a community for about 600 people. Their administrator, managing the daily affairs of what is not quite a native village, nor a country town. And their minister, preaching to them a simple Christianity. He is not on earth, but his spirit is resting on earth. He is in his words. He speaks to the people and to the people and to them. Let me enter in your heart the story of Dr. Schweitzer's life ends here in Lambarene on the Ogoe River, where his work has become an inspiration to people everywhere. But the beginning in the world that he gave up for all this is as important to the sum of his life as the end. It is 4,000 miles north as the crow flies in France, the province of Alsace, the Munster Valley, the village of Gunsbach. This is where Albert Schweitzer grew up, and here too there are people who know him well. In the third-class compartment on a train rolling through the Munster Valley after a long journey across France, Dr. Schweitzer returns to Gunsbach. His work in Africa has made him world famous, but at the station he will be greeted by only a handful of friends. There will be no fanfare. To the local people, he is Monsieur Albert, one of their own. And like them, one who prefers to come and go quietly. Alone, he steps to the platform wearing an old-fashioned black suit and a hat 40 years old. He looks after his own luggage and helps load it on a cart. A train man asked him why he rode on the hard benches of a third-class compartment. Schweitzer's answer was that he rode third because there is no fourth class anymore. Doctor. 
To the shy as well as to the bold, the doctor extends his hand until at last, with two members of his hospital staff who have arrived in Gunsbach before him, he begins the ten-minute walk from the station through the village to his ivy-covered house. For most men, the scenes of their boyhood have been retouched by modern times. But the village where Dr. Schweitz's roots are is not much changed in 80 years. While old men bask in the sun, passing the time of day, women still meet to do their laundry in a cold stream running beside a village street. When Albert Schweitzer goes by, they smile as to an old friend come home. His house, built in 1927, is very nearly the latest in Gunsbach. <laughs> it is like Sunday afternoon with the village choral society there to sing for him. Mrs. Schweitzer gathers her grandchildren around her to listen to the serenade. She worked many years with her husband in Africa until ill health forced her to return to Europe. These children were baptized in Gunsbach by their grandfather, but have never been to Africa, so he has missed their growing up. out that Dr. Schweitzer is in Europe again. His secretary, Emmy Martin, sorts letters pouring in from everywhere. Invitations to lecture, requests for personal appearances, offers of assistance, cries for help. Each morning in his office, Dr. Schweitzer tends to his mail. These times in Gunsbach are supposedly vacation periods, but he would not have made the long trip to Europe at all unless there was some work to do, some commitment to fulfill. Thus, even on a holiday, he is kept busy, but not too busy. Oh, The village church is a few hundred yards from Dr. Schweitzer's front door. In it is one of the many organs in Europe that he has designed or rebuilt or rescued from destruction. As an organist, craftsman and scholar, Schweitzer might easily have devoted his whole life to music. He chose the jungle hospital instead. But when he has time in Gunsbach, it is his greatest joy to come to this place and play his beloved instrument.
to Schweitzer, this is an ideal example of the village organ, an instrument perfectly proportioned to the size of the church. He plays Bach's prelude in D major. Like music, a man's life means more than the sum of its parts. It is a composition with many themes and one transcendent meaning. This is a fact of all life, and the life of Albert Schweitzer is not an exception, but an example. I was born on January 14, 1875, at Kaisersberg in Upper Alsace. Just two years before, at the end of the Franco-Prussian War, Alsace-Lorraine had been annexed to Germany by treaty. I was born in the house with the little tower at the left of the upper gateway of the town. Here, my father lived as pastor and teacher of the small Lutheran congregation, a minority in a predominantly Catholic community. When I was six months old, my father moved us to the parsonage in Gunsbach in a neighboring valley.
The road passes through places whose names are famous wine names. Katzenthal, Ingersheim, Amerschwier, Türkheim. As a child, I was proud when told that the year of my birth was a great vintage year. The road turns into the Minster Valley at Türkheim with its medieval gates. This beautiful valley runs high into the Vosges Mountains. It was the native district of my mother and her family, the Schillingers, a family of teachers, pastors, and organists. Günsbach is one of the smallest villages in the valley. Not more than a hundred houses clustered about the church like baby chicks around the mother hen. There are some Alsatian churches that hold services for both Protestants and Catholics. I liked the idea that in our village, everybody worshipped in the same church. And whenever I set foot in this place, I am filled with joy. This old photograph taken in the 70s shows my father's church looking much as it does today, except that now it has a new bell tower, which had to be repaired after it was damaged in the Second World War. The old parsonage still stands, and here my brother, my three sisters, and I passed our childhood. Our house was surrounded on all sides by other houses. It was damp and lacked sunlight. When we first came to Gunsbach, I was a weak child, but the wholesome air of the valley did wonders for me. In my second year, I improved and grew to be a sturdy boy. It was under this covered passageway that my father, one fine October day, put a slate under my arm and sent me off to school for the first time. I went, but I was weeping inconsolably, for I knew perfectly well that I was leaving my lovely, carefree childhood behind to enter the workaday world. This was my schoolroom. I was a quiet and dreamy child and learned to read and write with some difficulty. It was hard for me to keep my mind on my studies when my eyes were always wandering outside to the wonders of nature itself. I suffered deeply because the village boys did not accept me as one of themselves. To them, I was the pastor's son, one of the gentry, better off than they. My attempts not to be different from them in any way made no impression. They always made it clear to me that they considered me a stranger. Like all Alsatians at that time, we learned both German and French in school. Also at home, we spoke both languages. My older sister had a friend named Louisa. She asked me to write in her album, and as I was only five, Louisa wanted to guide my hand. Indignantly, I refused, and with intense effort wrote, Dear Louisa, do not forget your Albert Schweitzer. My first autograph is adorned with ink blots. When I was eight, my father, at my request, gave me a New Testament. One of the stories that interested me most was that of the wise men from the East. 
I could not understand why they never troubled themselves about the child Jesus after he grew up. What did Jesus' parents do with the gold and the treasure the wise men had brought? I wondered how they could have remained poor. It also seemed very strange to me that apparently none of the shepherds of Bethlehem ever became Jesus' disciples. At the age of nine, my life took a new turn. Every morning and evening, I walked nearly two miles over the hills to Münster, to the school where my parents had decided to send me. I was delighted to take these walks by myself, without any of the other boys, to think my own thoughts. How well I came to know the changing seasons. But the sheer youthful joy of being alive was something I never knew. I think this is true of many children who appear outwardly carefree and content. As far back as I can remember, I was shocked by the suffering that I observed in nature. Suffering brought about by the relentless struggle for existence. Still more shocking to me was the pain and misery inflicted on dumb, helpless animals by the negligence and thoughtlessness of men. On earth as it is in heaven, give us a... Even before I started to go to school, I couldn't understand why I was expected to pray only for human beings when I said my prayers at night. But deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So when my mother had drawn the shutters, and blown out the candle, and kissed me good night, I secretly said another prayer for all that had life, a prayer that I had made up myself. Dear God, protect and bless all living creatures. Keep them from evil and let them sleep in peace. An experience I had during these years made a lasting impression on me. A neighbor's son and I had made slingshots from rubber bands. One Sunday morning he said to me, come on, let's go up the mountain and shoot birds. This seemed a horrible idea, but I didn't dare object for fear of being laughed at. The birds were singing sweetly in the morning sunshine, so unafraid of us. Crouching like an Indian, my friend put a stone in his slingshot and took aim. Obeying his look of command, I did the same with acute pangs of conscience. At that moment, the sound of church bells began to mingle with the sunshine and the bird's song. To me, it was a voice from heaven. Shoot! 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 I frightened away the birds to protect them from my friend's shot and ran home. Ever since, when morning bells ring out in the sunshine, I gratefully remember those bells, for they rang into my heart the commandment, Thou shalt not kill. The manner in which this commandment against killing and cruelty worked upon me was the great experience of my childhood and youth. Gradually, I came to the unshakable conviction that we may bring death and pain to a fellow creature only under compulsion of absolute necessity.
and that we must all feel the horror of causing suffering and death by thoughtlessness. I became more and more certain that all of us feel this way, but do not dare to affirm it. We are afraid of being ridiculed as sentimental. We allow ourselves to become callous. Near Gunsbach lies the city of Colmar, and there on the Champ de Mars stood a monument which was later destroyed in the Second World War. It was designed by Bartoli, who created the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor. Every time I passed through Colmar on my way home from school, I went to see it. On the base was the Herculean figure of a Negro with a pensive, melancholy expression on his face, which spoke to me of the misery of the dark continent. It was he who turned my youthful thoughts towards far-off lands. When I was 18, we left the old damp parsonage and moved to a new one. This house opened on a sunny garden. We were then all in good health and lived in closest harmony together. The relationship between parents and children was ideal, thanks to the wise understanding with which our mother and father treated us, even in our follies. They educated us in the spirit of freedom. My father was my dearest friend. More and more, it became clear to me that I didn't have the right to take my happy family life, my health and my strength for granted. One who escapes misfortune and has received much from life should render thanks by doing something to relieve the suffering in the world. I realized that all of us must feel the responsibility of mercy and carry our share of the world's burden of sorrow. This, added to the realization of suffering that had so shocked me in my childhood, led ultimately to the philosophy of life that was to be of decisive importance for me. When I was 21, even though I was still seeking some fundamental principle of morality and life, I did make a decision. I resolved to devote my life until the age of 30 to preaching, teaching, and music. I would then look for and follow a path of immediate service as a man to his fellow men. What that path was to be, I was confident circumstances would determine. For the next nine years, Albert Schweitzer worked to fulfill this promise he made to himself. These years were spent first in study in Strasbourg, where he received degrees in philosophy and theology, then in Berlin, where he came in contact with the leaders of the German intellectual life of the day, and in Paris, where he studied the organ with Charles-Marie Vidor, the great teacher, composer, and organist. Then came years in which study was supplemented by intensive work in four fields, as organist, as writer, as university professor, and as preacher. At this time, he not only made a profound study of the organ as an instrument, but also pursued his research into the real nature of Bach's music. He chose to teach theology rather than philosophy so that his teaching wouldn't interfere with his career as a preacher. Preaching, he said, was a necessity of his being. The titles of the books he published during this period of his life indicate the scope of his interests. The life of his teacher, Eugene Munch, books on Immanuel Kant, Johann Sebastian Bach, Organs and Organ Building, St. Paul, and subjects related to the historical background of Jesus. Because of Schweitzer's unorthodox approach, these books on religious subjects were received with doubt by some and with open criticism by others. Underlying all these seemingly dissimilar subjects was a common element, what he himself called the everlasting struggle for truth. 
He worked hard with unbroken concentration during these decisive creative years. Denying time, he was accomplishing even more than he had originally set himself to do. But his 30th birthday was approaching, the day when he would turn, as he had promised himself, to the path of immediate service to his fellow men. The knowledge of the path he was seeking came to him suddenly one morning in the fall of 1904. A copy of the journal published by the Paris Missionary Society lay on his table. It was full of appeals for medical help in the jungles. Leprosy was prevalent. Sleeping sickness was spreading. One article in it was called The Needs of the Congo Mission. It read, Men who know how to say when the master beckons, Lord, I go with you, these are the men we need. His search was over. In Paris, one chilly October day in 1905, on the corner of the Avenue de la Grande Armée, Schweitzer put a half dozen letters into a mailbox telling his family and closest friends of his decision. He would begin the study of medicine, preparing himself to go to Africa as a doctor. There was an immediate response, a chorus of disapproval. What a strange idea. Now, really, have but you gone out of so Africa of all places? Well, Isn't a scholarship service? Isn't teaching service? Wait, wait a minute. Don't you go to the teaching service again for years? to master a new subject for which you are not prepared and uh, maybe not even suitable. Schweitzer remained adamant. From now on, the example of his life would be his sermon. He wanted to be a doctor so that he might be able to work without having to talk. Six years later, at the age of 38, he received his degree in medicine. He wrote a letter to the Paris Missionary Society at the completion of his internship, saying he was convinced he could found a hospital in Africa. He had continued to earn money writing, preaching, and playing the organ. Now, with the help of a few friends, he could pay for the hospital himself. He had heard the master's call. This was his answer.